Well, if you have a Bible with you, be opening it up to Acts chapter 27. Spend the majority of our time in Acts 27 tonight. I want to thank John for the song service tonight. He picked some excellent selections to go with our lesson, especially that last one of We Have an Anchor. Because I want to take a lesson tonight from a story we don't read too often at the very end of our book of Acts about the shipwreck, the shipwreck that Paul endured. Uh, and I think we see the analogy that is right there before us in the song that was so well crafted uh, that this question is, should be there for all of us. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? We should be ready to ask that to ourselves and think about the, uh, the, the, the true answer because those storms are coming in our lives. If we're not in the middle of a storm right now, which likely all likelihood is many of us are, then there's one right around the corner. Will your anchor hold? That's a critical question. So before we get uh, into some application that I think we can pull out of this text, let's read the story in all of Acts 27 with the 44 verses together. We'll be noticing as we read through, I'll pull up this map of Paul's fourth missionary journey because it's often just called his journey to Rome, but he never stops preaching the gospel, no matter where he's going. This fourth journey we, we uh, don't study as often, perhaps, as the first three. And we'll notice, you'll notice some of these locations as we see the places that Paul is going. Now, just a little bit of background. Paul has been imprisoned because of the, the uh, persecution of the Jews. They have made up false claims about his doctrine, and so when they were ready to kill him, the Romans actually protected Paul by, by putting him in their custody. And that gives him an opportunity. He appeals to Caesar because God had told him that you will get to witness uh, and share the gospel even in Rome. And so Paul appeals to Caesar, and after multiple trials on the way, before Felix, before Festus, before Agrippa, now he's finally on that journey to Rome to do the things that God wants him to do there. And so picking up in verse 1, when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in an Adramidian ship, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. From there, we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. So he's about to this point on that journey. Verse 6. There, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard it. When we had sailed slowly for a good many days, and with difficulty had arrived off Snidus, since the wind did not permit us to go farther, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salome. And with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. So Fair Havens is where they've now arrived. Verse 9. When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them and said to them, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, <clears throat> but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. Because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there, if somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. They were trying to get to a, a harbor that was on this far end of the island of Crete, called Phoenix. Verse 13, <clears throat> when a moderate south wind came up, supposing that they had attained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete close inshore. But before very long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind called Eurakilo, which means a northeaster, a northeasterly wind, one of those cold winter winds. And when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. Running under the shelter of a small island called Clauda, 
we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. After they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship, and fearing that they might run aground in the shallows of Sirtis, they let, they let down the sea anchor, and in this way let themselves be driven along. The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo, and on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us, from then on all hope of our being saved was gradually I'm sorry, from then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not have to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood behind stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted to you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe, God, that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on a certain island. So the part of the journey they're on now is this big, long, red streak here. They just wanted to make it to the end of Crete, and yet the winds had pushed them so far out to sea, they don't know where they are. They're somewhere out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. <clears throat> Verse 27, but when the 14th night came, this is two weeks into their journey trying to make it to the end of Crete. Uh, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And a little farther on, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. It's getting more shallow. Verse 29, fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. All of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. All of us in the ship were 276 persons. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. Verse 39. When day came, they could not recognize the land, but they did observe a bay with a beach, and they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. And casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind, and they were heading for the beach. But striking a reef where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable. But the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest should follow, some on planks, others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they all were brought safely to land. <clears throat> you see in the next verse that it says the island they land on is the island of Malta. Look at that distance. They just wanted to go here, but the storm that, they, that Paul had predicted drove them almost completely past where they were trying to get to, which is Rome. What a fantastic story. The first person account, uh, not, not only from Paul, but also from Luke. As you see, he uses the word we all the way through there. 
that he's on this boat with Paul too, experiencing uh, such a, a calamity. So let's think about these applications. I think they're all throughout. <clears throat> these lessons should teach us uh, how to handle the storms of life. Some of these things should encourage us. Some of these things should, should warn us and help us to prepare. Right off the bat, I think we see in verse 1 that we make plans, but it's God who knows the future. Look at what it says. It says that when it was decided that we would sail for Italy. What a nice plan that is. Have you ever put together a plan like that? Here's a nice destination. Let's just go. It seems simple, but... God knows what things are going, we're going to encounter along the way. We're going to take a drive out to Yellowstone here in a few days, and we know, <laughs> we're planning this, that it might not be you know, a smooth road all the way from here to there. There may be some trials along the way. Uh, we, we recall James 4 and verse 15. Uh, turn over there with me. Uh, what is it that we are taught to say? And it's an arrogant person who sets a plan without considering God. In James 4, beginning in verse 13, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. We always think of the, the good things. Can't imagine anything going wrong. Verse 14, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All boasting, all such boasting is evil. We must humble ourselves and recognize that it's God who knows the plan. If the Lord wills, we will what? Live and then do this or that. The first thing is we don't even know if we will live to do these things and make these choices. So keep that in mind, right? We then see that even though, yes, trials may come, <clears throat> blessings will come along the way, too, to give us some, some consolation. It's not that our life is going to be a completely difficult journey. Notice what happens in verse 3. <clears throat> Julius, <clears throat> the centurion, treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. You see how Paul's righteous living starts to show some benefit in his life, and that will happen to us as well. As we serve God, others will see that this is a person worthy of uh, some, some consideration. And so Paul's able to visit with brethren on this journey as a prisoner to Rome. How strange that is. But our, our, uh, uh, the, the blessings will come because we are servants of God. In Psalm 37, verse 25, the scriptures say, I, I was young, and now I'm old, and I've not seen the righteous begging bread. I've not seen the righteous forsaken, right? God is uh, aware of what the righteous uh, are doing, and they receive blessings along the way. That eases our journey, and we should be confident that God will bless us along the way. But they also apply some, some human wisdom, right? And we have more than just human wisdom. We have the wisdom of God. With wisdom, we can avoid many dangers. Notice what they do. In verse 4, it says, they, We put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. It actually mentions that multiple times, that they sail under the shelter of an island, Crete later on, or Siloam. They recognize, of course, that the geography affects the wind, right? And if we sail on the lee side of a mountain, you may be able to minimize some of the, the turbulence along the way. Is that not something we need to consider? Our life does not have to be full of every trial that comes upon a man. We have the wisdom of God to avoid some of those things. Look over in Proverbs. Uh, God, has, God would spare us so much heartache if we would simply do his will. Certain trials don't need to come upon us. Proverbs 23 is where we have a passage about drunkenness and about wine. It says, Proverbs 23, 29, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long over wine 
those who go to taste mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. So many want to debate this question of can a Christian have a single drink? Well, here, what's it telling you? Where is it telling you to stop? Is it with that first drink? No, it's with the looking on the wine when it sparkles in the cup and begins to entice. Because where will it end? Uh, every alcoholic begins with that first cup, right? It has to begin somewhere. And the w- wisdom of God is to stop at the looking because it brings so much trouble in your life. I'm sure we've seen it, how alcohol has destroyed families, has destroyed lives. All these things that God would spare us. Look back at Proverbs chapter 5. Here you have the wisdom of God <clears throat> as, a, as the, the wise preacher is teaching his son and wants him to avoid the difficulties in life in Proverbs 5 verse 3. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. The temptations to go after uh, another woman in adultery or to uh, enter into a sexual relationship outside the bonds of marriage brings so much heartache in this life. Initially, it looks wonderful, right? It looks like that sweet honey and that smooth oil, but later it ends in death. There was a just a heartbreaking contrast yesterday as we attended a wedding and see these two young people entering into this wholesome, God-centered marriage. I also ran into an old friend and was surprised to learn that he's now divorced. And I thought about him attending that marriage and how, or how it must be so difficult to, to see where it all began. And yet somewhere along the way, his marriage ended up on the rocks. And now he is suffering from the loneliness and the difficulties that come uh, following that. So much of these heartaches can be avoided if we will simply follow after God's way. Now we know not everything is under our control as we'll talk about here in just a moment. First, or another lesson we can see from from Paul's shipwreck is that we should recognize the seasons of greater danger. Notice in verses 9 and 10 back in Acts 27. Verse 9, when considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, (coughs) since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them. What's that fast? In my margin, it tells me that was the Day of Atonement. As Jesse has pointed out, that was the only fast commanded in the Old Testament. So it makes sense that that's what it would be in reference to. That's in September or October. When that's already over, what are you in now? You're heading into winter. And nobody wants to be out on the high seas in the dead of winter. And so that's why Paul's saying, guys, this is a really bad idea to be heading out to sea when it's this late in the year. Every winter, we, we kind of hunker down and prepare for you know, difficulty. We might get one of those big snows or one of these devastating ice storms like we got this year. And then in the spring, we got another storm season, right, where we're quite, maybe not even quite out of it with tornadoes coming through just this week. We recognize the storm season, and we try to prepare for that. Well, the same should be true of our lives. There are seasons of life where there's going to be trials. And I wish I could say, you know, there will be a season and then a nice 10-year stretch of ease and then another season that comes after that to watch out for. you got all this time to prepare. As I started thinking about the seasons of life where there's extreme danger, it's almost as frequent as winter. It's almost every year, every phase of life. Think about it as we go kind of from youngest to oldest. You know, when you're a young person who's, putting on Christ, making that choice to become a Christian. Well, you're in your high school years, maybe, maybe college years. And what do we see in that time of life? Well, in the scriptures, uh, over in 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, it talks about flee youthful lust. Does that mean there's no lust after you're a young person? No. 
but there's a lot more when you're young, right? There's a lot of temptation that you're going to be facing all the time. There's peer pressure, right? There's uh, sort, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol. There's just the desire to be out with the crowd and do what they're doing, to go along with them rather than to serve the Lord. There may be greater persecution in this period where you're choosing to put on Christ, but none of your friends are, and they're thinking it's strange. Just like the scriptures say, they think it's strange that you don't, do not run with them to the same excesses of dissipation. And suddenly you're the, you're the weird one just because you follow Christ. That's a trial. That's a storm of life. Will you forsake the, your mother's teaching? Will you forsake the scriptures and go with the crowd? But then you get into those college years. That's a really tough period, is it not? Uh, it's a period when you're making every decision that's going to affect the rest of your life, right? What's your major? What's your job? What's your career path? You know, uh, am I going to marry? Who am I going to marry? Where am I going to live? What kind of a job am I going to do? All these things, it just feels like, man, if I don't get this right in this little period, it's going to affect everything else. And that can just be a huge burden of stress upon us. And what can some people do? They can fall into, uh, into sin, right? They can forsake the Lord. I'm too busy. I got too much stress on me, so I don't have time for serving the Lord. Or fall in with the wrong crowd or make a decision uh, because maybe some lack of self-confidence. I marry the first person who comes along and don't put enough thought into what type of a person is that? That's the type of person. Is it the type of person that's going to serve God? Am I going to be able to have a spouse who helps me raise my children in the Lord? So many difficult decisions. Then, you, then you, the next phase as a young adult, we have little children. I remember that phase where we had three kids under six at one point, and you feel like you're not getting nearly enough sleep, and you're exhausted, and even going out to a restaurant is difficult because uh, it's hard to keep everything under control. It was in that period that we went to a funeral and uh, was we're talking with uh, some family members and I was just feeling, you know, beaten down and worn out and uh, talking to uh, an older uncle and he said, oh, that phase is easy compared to what's next. And I said, really? I thought this was probably like the hardest one. And he says, oh, just wait till all your kids are teenagers and young adults. And instead of, he's like, all you got to do is, you know, change their diapers and feed them and put them to bed, you know. And, but now, everybody's got a relationship. Everybody's got, you know, their, their spiritual journey, right? They're, you know, they're trying to find their own faith. But they got to figure out where they want to go and, you know, who they want to spend time with. And you got to worry about who they're spending time with. And he's like, just wait. And that was kind of discouraging, you know, to hear that it gets harder. But I wondered, would our older brethren tell him, just wait? Yeah, there's trials to come even beyond that, right? That's a difficult phase when you're, when you're helping your teenagers find the truth. There's a, you know, I think of it maybe as the launching phase where trying to get these, these, uh, these uh, birds to, to fly the nest and to fly in the right direction. There's temptation there, is there not? We want those children to fly right. We want them to choose to put on Christ and be faithful. But what if they don't? What a discouraging time that can be if a child falls away from the Lord. What will we do? Will we be faithful to the Lord? Or will we follow them? Right? I think of what, what Peter said to Jesus, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've got to determine now that storm is coming. You know, for us, we've got three. There's... there's there's three who will potentially put us to the test. Will we pass the test? Will we be faithful to the Lord even if our children do not? Perish the thought. We want each of them to be faithful. And we work now to ensure that they have what they need to make that choice. But think about the golden years, right? As we move into the latter parts of life, do the storms cease? Or do they get more difficult? Imagine... And we know, we deal with it every day, uh, the, the health issues that come, the loss of family members, the loss of a spouse, the, the encroachment of loneliness and spending a lot of time by ourselves. Each of these phases of life, each of these storms, we need to recognize that as they're coming, our faithfulness to God will be tested. 
and decide, am I going to sail through this storm and survive it? Or am I going to shipwreck? Is it going to be the end of my faith? Let's see what other uh, tips that we get from this story. Well, point three says, with wisdom, we can avoid many dangers. They're sailing under this island, sailing under this island, trying to avoid the storm. There's a whole lot that we can't control or prevent. There's some things that we're just going to have to go through because it's not always up to us. Look at verse 11. Paul gave them, gave them some great advice, but did they take it? No. The centurion was more persuaded by who? Pilate, captain, you know, seafaring men, right? Who are you, Paul? You're just a preacher. You're just a Jew. And so he listens to somebody else. So he takes another person's advice, and now Paul and Luke and everyone else are on a ship that's headed off into danger. That can be frustrating for us, right? That we're enduring the trials that are caused by other people. You think about what's on the news, right? We're, we're stuck in this ship that crazy people are running, right? It's like they're making decisions and it's affecting all of us and it's like we really wish different decisions were being made. And that can be difficult. Even in our, in our own lives, right? We talked about children. Children are, grow up and start to make certain decisions and then there's going to be consequences from those decisions and then we're going to be there to try to help them through the problems that sometimes they create for themselves. Same with a brother or a family member or a member of, of the Lord's church, right? We hope that people will come and help us share, their, share your burdens so we can bear one another's burdens. But when they do, we're going to have to help them through that. That's, that's a blessing of the Lord's church. And so we can't control or prevent everything. We've got to then be ready to see our way through that storm. Sorry. At the, yeah, we notice, though, in verses 14 and 15 that at times the storms may overwhelm us. It says, before long, this, uh, this Eurokilo rushes down, and when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. There's times when the storms of life are overwhelming. And I love that passage in Psalm 61 and verse 2. Uh, we have it on our wall at home, and we sing it sometimes. Uh, the rock that is higher than I. Psalm 61, verse 2, says, From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. We sang tonight uh, that Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. From the end of the earth, wherever the storms of life may drive you, as that ship's being driven off into the sea and they don't know where they're going to end up, they're overwhelmed. They don't know where this could end. This could be literally the end. But from there, wherever we find ourselves, we call to God, and he hears us. And that's where we have our rock. He is there to help us in those times where we are spiritually and emotionally overwhelmed. Look at 2 Corinthians verse chapter 4. This was our scripture reading. Every Christian should be able to say these things with Paul. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, We have this treasure in earth and vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus. Whatever comes, we can handle it, not because we are strong, but because he is strong. That's why he talks about this earthen vessels, that we, we are a fragile, weak person, weak mind, weak spirit, but it's with the power of God that we see the strength coming, right? The surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. When you see people sailing through difficulties, great difficulties, it's because they're putting their faith and trust in God and relying upon him. We must trust the anchor of our true hope. You see you see what they did with their anchors? 
It says, uh, after they had hoisted it up, the ship's boat, that is, verse 17, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship, and fearing that they might run aground in the shallows of Sirtis, they let down the sea anchor, and in this way let themselves be driven along. I'm not a, a sailor by any means, so uh, I don't know exactly how this works. I'm sure there's some who may know exactly how it works, but they didn't expect that anchor to hold, but they thought it would at least stabilize, right? Maybe it's like uh, putting on your trailer brakes when it gets kind of squirrely back there. Uh, so they're letting their anchor uh, be dragged as they're driven along. That's not a very effective anchor, is it? It's not what you really want. You want that anchor to hold fast. And that's what we sang about, right? Uh, when we, we have an anchor that keeps the soul. Uh, as we look over there in Hebrews 6, verse 19, there was a verse in there in that song that I think has been added back in that refers even more to this passage in Hebrews where we find this phrase. For years I thought that someone had just written a beautiful song, but we see that they've taken it from Hebrews 6 and verse 19. It's talking about the the confidence we can have in God that when he makes a promise, he keeps it and he, because he cannot lie. And he says, verse 19, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus, the high priest, has entered within the veil, and that is where the anchor is cast, in there in the presence of God. I think about that rope they used to tie around the high priest's leg or whatever so that he could go in, because he was the only one allowed to go in within the veil, and if he were to, to croak while he's in there, they may need to drag him back out, right? And, and so, obviously, Jesus isn't going to die. He's, he's life forevermore. But, he, but that rope is going through the veil, and that's our anchor, right? That we have that sure, steadfast rock, uh, the anchor of the soul. It's that hope. Seth spoke about it this morning, that our hope is what anchors us. That no matter what happens to us, even if we're literally on that boat that's going to run ashore and break up and, and we're off cast out, in, out a night and a day spent in the deep, like Paul describes, uh, we have that hope of eternal life because our anchor is cast uh, within the veil in the presence of God. That's where our trust needs to be. You know, in these moments of great distress, what matters, what really matters, is going to become clearer. That's one way to think positively about these trials that we go through. Notice what they start throwing out. Verses 18 and 19. They're jettisoning, jettisoning the cargo. They're throwing out the ship's tackle. That seems important, right? So their, their means of profit, their means of steering, their means of everything, they're throwing it out because what matters? Survival, right? Their goal here is just to lighten this ship so they don't run aground in these shallow areas and try to survive. That's, that happens when we go through a trial, does it not? Think about these people who lost their homes in the tornado about a year ago. So much faithfulness was seen and broadcast to the world. It made me so proud of our, our hometown because when these people were interviewed by these Nashville you know, uh, anchors, these people were undaunted because they were just thankful that they made it through with their lives. And they, it's like all these things can be replaced. None of that stuff matters. Do you feel that way today? Today it can be easy to forget that. Right? We can think, oh, my mortgage matters so much, or my, this, uh, this big review is coming up at work is really stressing me out, or the yard needs mowed, or whatever it is. Those things don't matter. What matters is survival, and we're not talking about physical survival. Spiritual survival is all that matters, and that's the focus that these trials should bring in our lives. So be thankful for the trials. It should help you focus on what matters the most. God sends these trials, right? These trials come. God allows them to come, but that's not really what he's intending for you. The goal of the trial is the salvation that comes at the end of the trial. Look at verse 22. When 
when Paul gets up and speaks, he says, Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. In verse 24, do not be afraid. Uh, or Sorry, the angel had said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. <coughs> See, this, this plan, this was all part of God's plan. This shipwreck was to end in a complete salvation of all the lives, and there was more to be done afterward. That should encourage us. <coughs> if you turn over to 1 Peter, verse 1. Sorry, chapter 1. Notice what it says about the trials that come our way. 1 Peter 1, verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. The trials have come. This is for the purpose of proving your faith with the end of the salvation of your souls. So we may ask ourselves, God, why are you allowing so much hardship in my life? Remember, this isn't what he's intending. This is not the end of what he wants for you. This trial is to produce the salvation, to produce the proof of your faith that comes after the trial. So we must make it through. If we let the trial shipwreck us, then it is the end. We shouldn't let it be the end. God's plan may not make sense to us. Notice verse 25. Uh, Paul then gives them the plan, right? He says, uh, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on a certain island. Boy, that doesn't sound like a very good plan, Paul. We're going to run into an island. That's how we're going to survive this? You can see, and we'll notice in just a moment, people don't like that plan very well. They start trying not to run aground on things, but that's the plan. That's something that takes some faith, a lot of faith, that when we're going through a trial, uh, difficult trials, that God's way is best, even if it doesn't seem to make sense to us in the moment. So many problems that we face, you know, someone said there's no problems like church problems, right, where there's disagreement among brethren. Uh, in those moments, where do we put our trust? Is it uh, well, I know the Bible says this, but I'm afraid it's going to make somebody else un unhappy. Or if I, if I speak this thing that I know is true, uh, it could cause someone else to leave. It might cause division, right? Or somebody has committed sin, maybe I should overlook that. Maybe I should sweep it under the rug for the sake of unity. No, God's way is best. We have to do it God's way and faithfully trust him to see us through those trials. If, if a person, if others don't want to serve God faithfully, we must say like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Even if it's just me and my house that are left at the end of the day. Joshua was ready to go into the promised land just as himself and his house if everybody else chose to follow the idols that day. God's plan may not make sense to us, but we need to follow it. And when we do that, we should proceed with no fear because God, our designer, knows what's best for us. These trials are part of that plan. In verse 29, as I noted a moment ago, they were fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, so they cast these anchors. Why are they fearing that they might run aground when God just told them that they are going to have to run aground? <clears throat> They're afraid of the very plan that God put in place. And we can proceed with a lot of fear at times, can we not? Okay, I'm going to do it God's way, but I don't think it's going to go well. I don't think it's going to work. What if God's plan doesn't work? That's the wrong attitude. We need to recognize that these 
plans are there for our benefit. In Hebrews 12, it talks about the way these, these uh, trials, they are like discipline, <clears throat> the way that we discipline our children in order to train them. In Hebrews 12, verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Don't be afraid of the trial. In children's terms, don't be afraid of the whooping, right? It's part of the training that comes. It takes a mature child to see that in the moment, right? It's sorrowful. We want to avoid that at all costs. But as we grow up, we may look back and thank our parents for those whippings because those moments trained us to become the person who we are, the disciplined person who we are. And so as we go through these trials as adults, we need to be thankful to God for the trials that have come in our lives because each one has prepared us to be a stronger person uh, going on and going forward from there. Matthew 25 is that parable of the talents where he talks about uh, you've been faithful in a few things, so I will set you over many things. See, we've got to learn to be faithful over something small, and that proves that we're now ready to take on something larger. These little tests prepare us for bigger tests later on. <clears throat> God wants to see us through, but we must be faithful. We see in this story an amazing description of God's grace. I don't know if you've noticed that, but all along here, God has been saying that he is giving Paul these people's lives. They're all going to survive. But is there a condition on that? There is. Over in verse 30, it talks about <clears throat> when the sailors were trying to escape from the ship. Uh, Paul then says, unless they remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. See, they had, the, the grace of God has been stated. You're going to survive. That's just like uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 8, right? That by grace you've been saved through what? Through faith. And it is the gift of God. See, God has given you salvation, but it requires faith. And faith here meant doing what was told to them. They had to stay in the ship. Just like for us, we have to stay in Christ. It's those who are in Christ who will receive the heavenly salvation and all the, the blessings that are in Christ, but only as long as we are in Christ. God wants to see us through, but we must remain faithful. And here we see <clears throat> that at times we must take action to ensure faithfulness. What is What was it that they were doing? See, there was this temptation. There was this little boat, right? If we could just get in this little boat and get off of the big boat, maybe we'd be saved in that. And so that's what these, these sailors were doing. They were trying to escape in the little boat. And when they realized, no, they've got to stay in the ship, what do they do? Verse 32, they cut away the ropes and the ship's boat, or of the ship's boat, and let it fall away. <clears throat> what does that remind you of? It reminds you of Matthew 5, right, when it says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, because it's better to enter into heaven maimed than to be whole and enter into hell. We've got to recognize the things that are preventing us from serving God faithfully and get rid of them, because our faithfulness is what God is looking for, in order to provide us with his grace. Acts 17.30 says, The times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now commands that all men everywhere repent. We know what it is that we must do, so we must repent and turn away from the sins that so easily ensnare us. Two more. When you're going through these trials, notice what Paul recommends. Strengthen yourselves. <clears throat> they went 14 days fighting this storm without taking any nourishment for themselves. If you try to go through the storms of life without the nourishment that God provides, you're, going, you're not going to make it. He wants you to be nourished and strengthened to face these storms. Verse 34, <clears throat> he encourages them to take some food, for this is for your preservation. When we face the trials of life, sometimes we get so overwhelmed that we maybe deprioritize our spiritual life. 
I'm too busy. I, I, I got too many tests or I got, you know, got to care for this loved one. We recognize so there's times when we have to care for a loved one and miss a service. Um, but where do we receive that strength? I remember the, the morning after my grandfather passed away. Uh, difficult night. Uh, he passed away about four in the morning on a Sunday morning. It felt like Saturday night because we'd been up all night. And it was difficult to get out of bed and go to services the next day. But how wonderful it was to be there to praise the one who put me through that trial, right? The trial of losing somebody who I love so dearly. And to say, blessed be the name of the Lord, right? Just like Job, who says, the Lord gives and the Lord taketh, taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He, he saw me through the trial, and now I want to praise his name. Don't forsake the Lord while you're going through a trial. He is the source of your strength. He is the source of your nourishment. <clears throat> and finally, it's in hindsight that we'll see God's wisdom. When they look up after the storm and find that all, what was the count, uh, 276, all 276 of them are alive. So even the ones who are floating on planks and things from the ship who couldn't even swim, survive. <clears throat> we will marvel that it was all God's plan and by following God's way, we are blessed. We don't always see it when we're in the middle of the trial, right? It's like this tornado that came through this week. They said it was rain wrapped. You're not even going to be able to see where it's at. We, don't, we can't see which way is up when we're going through the trial sometimes, but it's in hindsight that we will see it, and we'll be able to say, <clears throat> oh, the depth and the riches of God's saving grace, right? I can't believe how much he has done for me. And look at his marvelous plan. But what does 2 Corinthians 5, 7 say? It says, we walk by faith and not by sight. That's why. Because we're down here and he's up here. He sees where we need to go. He sees how this moment in your life is forming you for the next moment of your life, to prepare you for what's ahead. And it's all his will. So we walk by faith, trusting in God that these things are for our good and that we will get through it as long as we lean on him. <clears throat> it's quite a list. It's a story that, I don't know, I felt like it was almost like a throwaway, just getting us from point A to point B in Paul's life, but right there in that story, you see how to get through the storms of life. We won't go through that for sake of time, but hopefully some of these things will help you to endure and press on to the day when we will receive that which we are hoping for, when we arrive where our anchor is cast. Surviving the shipwreck. We haven't even talked about 1 Timothy 1 verse 20. <clears throat> where it talks about that shipwreck in uh, a figurative sense. It talks there about keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Another example of those who had to be withdrawn from this fellowship, Mark, and avoided because they had chosen to go astray. But here described as those whose faith had shipwrecked. When the, when the difficulties came, they let that be the end of their story, rather than going through the trial to the, the glorious payoff on the other side. Will this be you? Or will you prepare for the storms that are ahead? Make that decision tonight. If you're outside the body of Christ, we hope that you would become a Christian tonight by hearing the word of God, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and then being baptized to have those sins washed away and to rise to walk in newness of life as a member of the Lord's church. But then comes a life of trial and testing and perfecting, and that's what many of us are going through at this very moment. We're not finished yet. God's not finished refining us with fire. And we need to be ready 
to endure so that we can be with him one day. If you're outside, if you've, if you've fallen away, if you've let sin creep into your life, if you've let doubt uh, cause you to end up on the rock, uh, we can help you by turning your life back to God tonight. Whatever your need is, we invite you to come while we stand and sing our invitation song.